you are a little lighter in the wallet, I reckon, because it was tax day last week. A one-time, only perhaps, shift from the traditional April 15th tax day. But some things never change no matter when tax day falls. We, the average person, we pay our taxes, while the rich and big corporations dodge paying what they owe. And that's on tap today on the show. And with all the burdens we have financially these days, and not to minimize the crisis, it's still not as dire as the prison-like conditions facing hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs who are being put at the mercy of global capitalism by China. And you get to hear that story today firsthand from a Uyghur human rights activist, as well as an international labor organizer. This is Jonathan Tassini. It's great to have you back on the show. And this is the show for July 22nd, 2020. As usual, just a reminder that our major sponsors, the American Postal Workers Union, which fights for dignity, respect, and good wages for its 200,000 members and retirees, as well as 2,000 private sector workers, you too can become a small donor. We really urge you to do that this week. Become a small donor and a supporter of this show. You can do that in two ways. You can either go over to workinglife.org, click on the podcast tab, and then search for our link over to Patreon. And you can sign up there for a one-time donation or maybe become a regular monthly sponsor. Or if you're more comfortable because you're used to it, we partnered up with Act Blue. And you can go over to Act Blue and look for the Working Life Network show with Jonathan Tassini. And there you can see the URL and you can join up again with Act Blue either on a one-time basis or we prefer, of course, on a regular monthly contribution at whatever level you can afford. Now, before I get to the segments that we have on tap today, a week from now, the enhanced pandemic unemployment benefits will run out and millions of people will be left without that income. And you've got a bunch of these wealthy members of Congress, mostly Republicans, but a few Democrats, too, who are swearing and whining up and down that, by God, they won't approve all that big pot of money again for people because people will choose to stay home and roll in those riches rather than work. Now, let's remind everyone, we are talking about the grand princely sum of $600 per week, which for most people simply means and meant that they could maybe squeeze out the monthly rent or pay for food or gas. No one is buying the kind of mansions or fancy cars on that amount that the rich people who are whining about this and who are aiming to impoverish people are used to picking up with their wealth. And not to mention that by giving those people $600 a week and letting them stay home, that actually is helpful in controlling the pandemic because then people aren't feeling forced to have to go to work to get a paycheck. It's a minor, minor attempt at trying to help people in this economic crisis. And that argument by the rich people in Congress, mostly Republicans, it's an immoral argument to put it modestly. So I will make another pitch today, as I've made the last several weeks, continue to badger everyone you know, and of course, mostly your members of Congress, to get behind Representative Pramila Jayapal and her bill, and that's H.R. 6918, the Paycheck Recovery Act. And there's a similar bill in the Senate, co-sponsored by Bernie Sanders and several other senators, that would allocate money to pay people up to $90,000 a year until the unemployment rate declines below 7% for three straight months. And reminder, 7% is still pretty high, but at least we can pay people real wages to get them through this economic crisis. That's the least we should be doing. A couple of weeks ago, I had a segment on the show about a new national security law imposed by China on Hong Kong, which was primarily aimed at shutting down the mass protests that have consumed Hong Kong for more than a year and it was really targeting especially union activists who had been signing up people by the dozens, by the hundreds, actually, by the thousands into new unions. And back then, last week, and you can see actually two weeks ago, and you can see that episode, as always, all of our episodes can be found in our archive. I made an important distinction that I keep in mind when it comes to criticizing China from a progressive vantage point. Now, Trump and his enablers are rolling out racist language as part of a campaign, as you probably have heard, to blame China for the coronavirus pandemic. Blame China, of course, improperly. But as progressives, the critique of the leaders of China can be strong. 
when we focus on the truth that China's leaders and the elites there are willing partners of global capitalism. They've been opening up their doors willingly to corporations like Walmart and other huge multinational companies. So those companies can produce trillions of dollars of stuff using cheap slave labor, labor that is controlled and oppressed by its own government in good capitalist style, I would add. So keep that in mind today. Since 2017, China has been conducting a steady campaign of mass transfer of more than a million Uyghurs and members of other Muslim minorities into a vast network of re-education camps in the far west region of Xinjiang, which Uyghur activists call East Turkestan. Think of the Japanese internment camps in the U.S. during World War II or apartheid in South Africa, and you will get a flavor of what is up. The key difference, perhaps, is that this is being driven a lot by the thirst of global capitalism for cheap slave labor. Tens of thousands of Uyghurs are being forced to work in factories that are in the supply chains of at least, and I'm saying at least, 83 well-known global brands in the technology, clothing, and automotive sectors, including Apple, BMW, Gap, Nike, Samsung, Sony, and Volkswagen. Tomorrow, a worldwide call will be issued by 71 Uyghur rights groups and over 100 civil society organizations and labor unions from around the world, demanding that apparel brands and retailers stop using this forced labor. This is slave labor, folks. This is people working and being forced to work under slave-like conditions. To give us more insights into what is happening to the Uyghurs, I'm pleased to welcome Rahima Mahmoud. She's a Uyghur singer, award-winning translator, and human rights activist who is living in exile in London. And she'll be speaking along with Brian Finnegan, the global worker rights coordinator in the International Department of the AFL-CIO. And Rahima, you've been living in London actually almost for two decades, partly because you can't go back to where you're from and where your family is. And I know that must be really uh, vexing and trying for you. It's a, it's a hard time. You can't communicate with your family members. And in, in some of the materials that I read, especially your first person account, you seem to divide the repression that has happened to Uyghurs and um, your family members and people you know into two parts, that after the Cultural Revolution in 1976, mosques reopened, there was relative freedom. And then after Tiananmen Square, there was a change. So describe in your view what's happened in terms of the, the, the change and the repression that's come upon your folks. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I remember uh, in my childhood, uh, my father and uh, my brothers, they prayed. Uh, they had to lock the gate from inside the house and often warned me and other siblings that do not tell other people that we prayed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was uh, before the 80s, 1980s. So I remember then um, towards the end of, uh, I think I was year one or year two, started my uh, primary school and uh, things changed. The mosques were opened and people extremely happy that for Muslims, it is such a big thing, especially a kind of religious family like mine. And so that's why I say that uh, for eight, eight, from maybe the 1980 to 1989, these nine years were kind of golden years after the uh, Cultural Revolution that people suffered so much. And, uh, uh, you know, the labor camps, people were taken into, into labor camps. Um, or, or we have songs called the Tarim, it's about a labor camp as well. So then 1989, the student movement, the new leadership, that, that, that it started to deteriorate mm -hmm. uh, countrywide and also uh, in my country. Uh, I call it East Turkestan. And so was the labor repression, was that evident from the very beginning? In other words, where your people were repressed by the Chinese government for religious reasons, but then they 
used folks in forced labor camps in order to essentially feed the supply chains of global corporations. Was that always true or is that a more recent development as far as you can tell? No, actually, uh, since the CCP occupied uh, East Turkestan 1949, from the, uh, in 50, uh, 1955, uh, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region was uh, actually declared, but it has never, they have never honored that uh, agreement, mm -hmm. Autonomous Region Agreement. Then 19, from 1958, the rightist movement started, then targeting the, the rich, wealthy, uh, and the, uh, during the Cultural Revolution, it's not just target the, uh, the Uyghurs, so that was the whole countrywide movement targeting intellectuals and uh, business people. Mm -hmm. um, so anyone uh, really, that uh, the uh, governments or authorities didn't like, they took them and uh, they, they put, uh, sent them to camps. Uh, they, at that time, it is either called uh, um, reform, through, reform through labor. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had uh, these sort reforms. But for now, uh, since uh, uh, 2016 and 17, is, uh, specifically, from April uh, 2017, this large internment mm. started uh, targeting the, uh, primarily targeting the Uyghurs and other Turkic, Turkic Muslims. And uh, uh, later we learned uh, only, I think, from the end of 2018 and last year, that actually a lot of Uyghurs who were interned sent to uh, these um, factories mm. to uh, to work as a slave labor, yeah. And so let's bring Brian into the conversation. Brian, this seems like very familiar territory for those of us who have watched international labor rights over many years. You've got these massive global supply chains, these big companies essentially exploiting uh, low-wage labor. And China is not a mystery to us. This has been happening for a long, long time. What has changed or what do you see as different with the repression of the Uyghurs from uh, certainly a religious standpoint and how that's being used now to supply companies like, and I'm reading from a report uh, that was put out by in Congress, you've got Adidas, Calvin Klein, Coca-Cola, Costco, H&M, Kraft Heinz, Nike, Patagonia. You've got all these big name brands essentially exploiting those workers there for their production purposes, right? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the global supply chains of all the companies you named and any major company and some even smaller ones extend everywhere. So companies have quite deliberately gone to places where there is often at best a governance gap where the government isn't doing things to prevent, you know, horrible labor conditions. Uh, we've seen this over decades, even mm. before they had far flung supply chains. We had the Triangle Shirt Waste Factory in New York. That was a supply chain mm. fire killing over 100 in 1911. And in 1991, you have a poultry factory in North Carolina where you know governance gaps happen. They always have happened. I think the difference is companies have quite deliberately gone to places where they know there are governance gaps or they know that the government actually does much worse than not be present government in places that forces people to labor. And I think the question of the, uh, the Uyghur region, this part of China has, has just been very important for the production of certain supply chain issues. I mean, they say that one out of five cotton shirts in the world has some cotton from this region. And the political and, and cultural pieces that Rahima talked about, really just companies go in there, they know and they have ways of managing risk. And we can go into more detail about that, but sure. their interest is risk management, whether it's reputational or legal. And there are real legal problems. There are violations of US law and other countries' laws. So companies go in and then they put together these systems where they say, oh, well, we will be vigilant. We will try and make sure the worst things don't happen. But that thing called human rights due diligence is absolutely impossible in this part of China. And I would argue in most places in China for certain issues like freedom of association, it's, it's completely impossible to do human rights due diligence. 
and you mentioned cotton production in East Turkestan. Uh, from what I read, 84% of China's cotton production comes just from that region that then translates into the apparel imports that come into the United States from China and obviously other places in the world. So there really is this global produ production system that we've seen, as you pointed out, Brian, uh, in China for a very long time. And so to your point, Brian, about risk reduction or the, the way in which companies analyze risk, this is their perfect storm in some way, because when you have a region that's under the thumb of an authoritarian government and they're putting people in internment camps, you can't get any better, and I'm being sarcastic about this, you can't get any better in terms of a controlling a workforce than that, right? And at the same time, they have these commitments that they've made through their own codes, through international agreements with the, with the ILO and the UN, all of these sort of half measures that are not quite law, they're statements of standards that are then sort of held up as we don't tolerate forced labor, but they go into places where they cannot, even if they wanted to, they couldn't do authentic worker interviews and workplace visits with knowing that the workers are able to talk honestly and frankly. Mm -hmm. And even the State Department, the beginning of this month, July 1st, released a business advisory. And one of the points that they buried a bit, but they said in very clear language, usual human rights due diligence, going in there and trying to make sure that the worst things aren't happening. It's not really possible to do that in this repressive region. The problem right. is that they turn around and then say, so do human rights due diligence? And we're saying, you just said it doesn't work there. You got to do something else. And what we're calling for is exit responsibly. Okay, so let's now move to what Rahima and you um, are working on in terms of the call to action. Rahima, let's start with you. What is it that the global community needs to do in terms of, I assume, pressuring the corporate world, these supply chains, to basically make sure that those, this internment, this oppression, this repression of people ends, or as it at least begins, as Brian pointed out, there's some ability to monitor how the workplace looks in those internment camps and in that forced labor situation? Well, uh, in a kind of simple way, I, I would say when the product couldn't sell, when they couldn't sell the products, uh, when the less uh, companies, a business interested in getting them, that actually will have a very uh, powerful impact on uh, you know, China's economy itself. Mm -hmm. And maybe that will push the behavior uh, of the Chinese authority. That's the best we can uh, bet here. And uh, therefore, I mean, the business community up until now, uh, you know, we didn't really hear them taking any actions, uh, you know, from small companies to big companies. And as you said, cotton product, 84% coming from, from uh, East Turkestan. And uh, uh, we know from the cotton picking, the forced labor is uh, involved. Um, therefore, if we could uh, convince these uh, big uh, brands uh, that stop um, getting their products from these, uh, the supply chains that is actually using the forced labor, mm -hmm. that might make a difference. And it's a hard situation to manage because if you look around the world, there's, there have been attempts, for example, to change uh, the conditions in places like Bangladesh where there were these terrible fires and there were accords made with these suppliers, these big brands. And all they seem to have done is shift their production or figure out other places to go, for example, to East Turkestan. And you, the names Nike come up again and Apple come up again. They've been already caught using slave labor and low wage labor in both in China and other places in the world. So it's almost like if I can use that term, the whack-a-mole situation, you're trying to grab them and control them. But really at the end of the day, it's in some way the end, the system, it's capitalism. It's, they're gonna find other places and it's in particularly a problem in China in an authoritarian regime where you can't do, for example, surprise inspections. You can't just land in a country and come to a factory and make sure conditions are better or adhered to, right, Brian? Yeah. Uh, challenge. 
it's even in the better situations or even the best of situations, the corporate driven ways of doing due diligence, that is audits, inspections, these are always flawed because they are corporate driven mm. and you don't have actual worker driven responsibility in a corporation. So when you go into a place like this part of China or China at large, you can't do those programs, which are always flawed. So what we're calling on the companies to do is at least stop profiting by this forced labor. And I want to back up to something you said very quickly. Mm -hmm. We're not just talking about, you know, garment imports from China. The fact is that China exports a lot of this cotton and it exports it to places like Bangladesh, Vietnam, Cambodia. So it is a whack-a-mole situation. So part of what we're calling on the companies to do is know your supply chain, show your supply chain, and clean up that supply chain. So if the company says, okay, we're not going to bring garments from China or from this part of China, from East Turkestan, that's good. That's a step. But where is that cotton going? Are you buying from a producer in Bangladesh that has got the same cotton? So it's, it is complicated, but it can be done. And I think that that's what we're calling on is, you know, you talk about the Triangle Fire, you talk about the Rana Plaza factory collapse. These are events that suddenly brought to light systematic injustice. What we have here is over three years of systematic rounding up people, putting them involuntarily in jobs, sometimes in camps, sometimes making them move to different parts, thousands of miles away from their country, from their, their homeland. So this, this is a, uh, it's a slow burn or a slow systematic way of operating that it's time for the companies to step up and, and, and say, we can't do our due diligence here. So we're going to find other places to get this material and source from elsewhere. And Rahima, what these companies are doing, obviously, in addition to repressing folks, uh, Uyghurs in the area in East Turkestan, in terms of wages and horrible labor conditions, it's also essentially assaulting their uh, community and their culture and the whole way in which people have lived there, right? Absolutely. And only uh, in March, a friend of mine living in Turkey sent me a message about a young man who was uh, picked up um, uh, from Khotan, from his home, um, and then he was um, uh, summoned to, uh, to go to a local school. And when he uh, went there, there were already like hundreds of uh, Uyghur youth. This was at the peak of the coronavirus uh, lockdown in China as well. Um, everywhere were closed and 1,000 Uyghur, Uyghur youth, just that, that one day, Mm -hmm. And they were assembled about 1,000 from two regions, from uh, Khotan and from Kashkar, these two most Uyghur populated regions. Uh, and they were, um, stayed, they stayed in this uh, uh, school overnight and uh, uh, March it was cold, they were not provided any um, uh, beddings or anything. And then the next morning they were taken to to train station, and uh, uh, they arrived uh, overnight at uh, Urumqi in Urumqi. Then again they st stayed in in a large hall. Uh, then they were um, separated at in like, like a five to ten in one group, and the buses just picked them up and took them to various different uh, different uh, factories. And these people didn't know where they were going. They were not people who are uh, uh, locked up in camps. Mm -hmm. And so when the police actually came to inform um, uh, the family um, about that uh, two days later, uh, he is going to move to somewhere else. So the mother uh, questioned the police, said, my son has a job here. And uh, a police said, no, this is the order from the above. Hmm. And do they have any contact with people who are then transported? I assume this is a long way away, right? Is it hundreds of miles away from where they were from and where they lived? Yes. Yeah. But and he ended up in a, in a factory, drink factory, uh, 
two, uh, two three days later. He didn't know where he, he was taken. And he said, uh, I don't know, apart from nine of us, uh, we are now here. The rest, we don't know. They, even uh, close friends, they don't, they don't know where they were taken. Hmm. And to make the obvious point, both to Rahima and Brian, one of the problems is in China, generally, you don't have independent unions. You don't have the ability to organize those people who are not, not just in this situation, but generally speaking, workers who can stand up to this regime. There is no independent union movement in China. Well, that's why the AFL-CIO for decades has been pointing out the many problems of violations of human rights and labor rights. And the fact that corporations can go in with their corporate codes and say, we've audited and we've inspected and we say that they are meeting freedom of association requirements or standards, it's, it's ludicrous. But <laughs> they find a way to do it and they find cooperative organizations and multi-stakeholder initiatives and it's, it's really just uh, whitewashing a problem we've known about for decades. But this case is so egregious, and it is a cross-sector. We're talking garment and cotton here right now, but you've mentioned Apple, their, the Australian report that I think you saw. Yep, Coca-Cola. Yes, it, you know, Heinz ketchup. There's, there's a lot of tomato production and exports there as well. But we just happen to have you know, the fact of so much of the cotton, one out of five shirts, 86% of the Chinese cotton, and a pretty well organized group of human rights, labor rights, and unions who follow garment, because garment is a sector where you see this in the whack a mole fashion you described. Hmm. It moves around. Hmm. Here's a challenge that I throw to both of you and ask you how you navigate this moment in time of criticizing China rightly for the way in which it's repressing workers generally and Uyghurs in East Turkestan and the, the global reality that China, at least from the United States, is being attacked in relation to the coronavirus. You see Donald Trump using tremendous amounts of racism targeting China. So it must be a fine line or at least a very important contrast, or you have to be subtle about pointing out that obviously you don't embrace and aren't trying to articulate this racist language that Donald Trump is using towards, towards China. But there are real serious issues about the authoritarian regime, which is really serving global corporations. This isn't about communism versus capitalism. It's about capitalism being in some way enforced on people in China. Well, I'll, I imagine Rahima could say a lot about this, but I'll just quickly say that. Yeah, let's let, let's let each of you comment about that. Go ahead, Brian. So it's, it's really been important for us, first of all, to make clear, and this will become clear when we have the public call to action next week, or the 23rd, this is a global coalition. This is not just about you know, what the AFL-CIO or US workers or US organizations think. This is, this is global. This is, a, 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 it's consistent with you know, things like forced labor and, and anti-trafficking principles that are things that we've been talking about and, and denouncing for a long time in China and anywhere. Mm. So we are very consistent and on long record on this. And that, that's, that's the first thing. And I would say that, you know, the fact is that a lot of companies know that there's a problem and there are some who are already working on leaving. But I think what we'll see is they might not want to say what they're doing because China is for them also a market. Mm. So this is, again, the, the capitalist system that you know, not only tolerates some things that you say you're against, but don't even say anything, even if you're acting against those things, because you're concerned about a market. What's your view about this, Rahim? How do you how do you pose those two and say to the world, um, this isn't about attacking China and being racist in the in the Donald Trump way, but there is a reality that people, more than a million people, are being repressed and forced into internment camps for really the goal of making profits for big companies? Yes, um, call to action um, itself, um, it, it's very clear our target, you know, we are not targeting the Chinese people, not even the Chinese country as, mm. as, as a whole. Uh, we are not asking boycott China, for example. Mm. We are, uh, our message is very, very clear. It's very fair. Um, so uh, another thing for me encouraging is this is actually since the uh, 
2017, uh, you know, the atrocities uh, have been happening. Actually, maybe one of the first global movement, uh, 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 this call to action, having this so many coalition come together and uh, as, uh, calling for um, action. Uh, and uh, so this actually also um, is a comfort for the Uyghurs because we feel, felt uh, the world has been silent mm -hmm. for so long. Uh, not only the uh, just the government, also the civil society as well. So I think this is a a, ver a very uh, important move. I will say this is a start. Well, this call to action is coming out tomorrow, and on this show we will continue to talk about it and cover it. And Rahima and Brian, please feel free to come back on the show and give us an update on how. The movement is going to hold these global corporations accountable and not let them essentially pocket these profits at the expense of Uyghurs, the people who are in these enforced internment camps. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you thank, for having me. Thank you for your interest in inviting us. So we all got that reprieve on tax deadline. But something never changes. The rich and corporations just don't pay their fair share. So here are a couple of nuggets for today. While tens of millions of people were thrown out of work and some lost their housing because of the pandemic, 600 billionaires had no worries at all. Check this stat out. I'm laughing because it's so pathetic. From March 19th to the middle of May, just a couple of months, their wealth grew, these 600 billionaires, from $2.948 trillion to 3.382 trillion. Think about that for a second. Just 600 people got richer by $434 billion, which could pay for millions of people's rent or unemployment payments or just keep people employed. What a stupendous example of corruption and immorality and an incredible example of the bankruptcy of this entire economic system. And speaking of billionaires, my second nugget, you've probably all heard this example. Amazon paid zero taxes in 2017 and 2018, despite having huge profits, which just piled on Jeff Bezos' personal wealth so he could continue to be known as the wealthiest man on the planet. And lo and behold, Amazon has made a big deal about paying whoopee taxes this past tax year, a whopping 1.2% of its $13 billion in profits. Think about that compared to the percentage you pay. Amazon is going to pay 1.2% on $13 billion in profits in 2019. And to boot in the height of public relations bullshit propaganda, Amazon celebrated paying $2.4 billion in payroll taxes, which, as our friends at the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy point out, is like congratulating yourself for breathing. All the company does is collect the taxes and send them to the feds. Now, keep that in mind for the next few minutes. One of the reasons these very rich people and corporations can scam us is the careful, relentless undermining of the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS. Now, admit it to yourself. Somewhere in a dark little place, you have a smidgen of a lack of love for the IRS. Maybe not for you, but for millions of people, that's the end result of decades of smearing and attacks on the IRS by right-wingers who have a complete disgust for paying any taxes to keep a decent society functioning. And Congress has been the willing tool for that anti-IRS campaign over time, cutting its budgets year after year. Now, what does that mean? It means this. Rich people and corporations don't pay what they should because they know the IRS is not equipped to keep pace with the armies of lawyers that rich people and corporations hire for the sole purpose of dodging and avoiding taxes. Now, this isn't just my theory. Bernie Sanders actually asked the Congressional Budget Office to look at what was up with the IRS. And sure enough, 
Congress has cut overall resources to the IRS since 2010 in deep ways, 20 to 30 percent, with the biggest hit coming, of course, to the enforcement staff. Now, what does that mean? It means that hundreds of billions of dollars in taxes go unpaid, and about 70 percent of that amount is underpayment, which is a euphemism for dodging, by the top one percent. Here's how Bernie put it recently, and now I'm quoting. With the money that these tax cheats owe, this year alone, we could fund tuition-free college for all, eliminate child hunger, ensure clean drinking water for every American household, build half a million affordable housing units, provide masks to all, produce the protective gear and medical supplies our health workers need to combat this pandemic, and fully fund the U.S. Postal Service. So those are the real consequences of the tax cheating that is done, unfortunately, in legal sense, but they still dodge their taxes. This is all done by the rich and very powerful corporations, and that makes our society a lot weaker. So let's dig deeper into how the wealthy scam the system and how their congressional enablers allow them to do so with our good friend, Amy Hanauer, who is the executive director of the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy. So here we are now, a week after all of us have hopefully filed our taxes, Amy, and the world now can move forward into coping with the rest of our lives, the pandemic, and making a living. And every year, I have you guys on to talk about the tax system around tax day, which of course is usually is in April, and this time was in July. And obviously, we can talk about the unfairness of the tax system, the fact that it's not progressive enough, which seems to me to be this refrain every single year, and especially with the uh, Trump tax cuts, then if you go back to the George W. Bush tax cuts and so on. But I wanted to start and focus our conversation on something different, and that is the way in which over a number of years, the IRS has been hobbled in its ability to do its job to essentially collect taxes. And I wonder if in the macro way, the first thing we want to address is in some way, your challenge as an advocate for the proper way in which we should tax people and collecting taxes is it's number one, it's a little arcane, right? Except for you and I who love to talk about this. <laughs> and then as you point out, as your colleagues pointed out in some of the documents and information that you produced in light of this new report from the Congressional Budget Office about the IRS funding, you say that lawmakers' anti-government IRS funding cut zeal has actually increased the deficit. So riff on that for a minute or two. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, don't no no don't call me wonk. <laughs> I don't mind that. I don't I don't think that's a I consider that to be a compliment. All right. Well, then thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, it is a compliment, right? Because this stuff really, really matters. It, and that's, that's why we work on it every day, right? There's a lot of talk right now about injustice. But, you know, one of the biggest injustices is, are we raising enough to pay for the kind of society that Americans deserve and to pay for the things that all of our communities need? And the answer to that is resoundingly no. But one of the reasons is, is what you're talking about, which is that there's been this sort of systemic assault on the Internal Revenue Service's ability to just collect taxes. And so we've been cutting their budget, um, I believe by 20%, and that has resulted in a plunge in the number of specialists who are available to do these audits or any other kind of inquiries. And that means that people aren't paying their taxes and companies, more importantly, big corporations aren't paying their taxes and wealthy people aren't paying their taxes. And that means less revenue. So the irony is we could pay a little more into the IRS budget and we'd actually end up with more money overall. And the sad thing, just to focus on the propaganda, is obviously you hear a lot of the right wingers yelling and screaming about the IRS and the injustice. But I often feel like even among, I don't know about progressives, but beyond just the real wingers, the right wingers, the people who hate the IRS, who hate government, I just think that there seems to be not support for the IRS because people don't sense that their taxes are going to good things. I mean, when they don't 
a focus on it, right? There's a lot of, oh my God, I have to pay my taxes. I consider it my, my duty and I don't actually mind paying taxes. I would rather they not go to the Pentagon. I would rather they go to other services, but that's the world we live in today. But I, I wonder just to carry this point a little further, that the IRS in fact suffers from this image that they don't have a lot of advocates. Yeah, well, absolutely. And I think there's been a, you know, there's been a real discussion in recent years, and I think about it a lot, right? I am critical of a lot of the things that the public sector does. But the fact is, if we want our kids to be educated, if we want healthcare to be provided, if we want clean water, if we want meat to be inspected before it gets sent to our plates, you know, then we need a strong public sector. And the only way to get that is to have adequate and fair revenue raised from the people most able to pay it and the corporations that are profiting the most from everything that the public sector offers and enables them to thrive. And so we've got to have reasonable revenue collected and it's got to be collected fairly. And I think to the, to the point that you kind of raised at the beginning of this session, if the IRS is not well funded to actually enforce the tax code, it's kind of this negative downward cycle because they don't collect enough, number one, and so then they have less money to do the things that we all need them to do. But then number two, it feeds into a perception that other people aren't paying taxes, so why should I care about paying mm. taxes? Mm. And the fact is, what we really have is most people want to, you know, nobody, maybe people don't love paying taxes, but most people follow the rules and pay their taxes the way they should. Most working people don't really have much of a choice because their taxes are deducted from their paychecks. And so we really need firm enforcement, just like any other area of public policy, right? We need the rules to be followed so that they're the same for everyone, so that it's fair and so that people feel comfortable with the rules as they're being enforced. And to your point, it's a circular problem because when Amazon pays zero in taxes, and you've got Amazon run and owned by the richest human being on the planet, Jeff Bezos, and they're paying zero. And then that average person who faces a tax deadline, who's making an average income says, well, wait a minute, Amazon's not paying any taxes. Why should I pay taxes? And that's where I think the anger begins to build on itself because people hear the news and they absorb it and they basically feel like, and they're right, the system's not fair. Right. And so we've done previous research that showed that 91 profitable Fortune 500 companies didn't pay anything in taxes in the most recent year that we examined. And that's, you know, that's just not, that's just not okay. But the fact is that the co companies need a strong public sector and certainly people and communities need a strong public sector because like, look at the pandemic that we're in right now, right? Mm. We have a problem where because of our inability because of our refusal to provide health care to much of our population because of our insistence that people should sort of be in a deeper level of poverty than really is reasonable for the wealthiest country on earth mm. and because of um you know th this inadequate health infrastructure this underfunding of pandemic preparedness underfunding of vaccine research we're in a position right now where actually a bunch of companies are suffering and certainly a lot of communities are suffering and, and low income and working families are suffering disproportionately. So it really kind of gets right back to um, the core point, which is like, if we don't have a well-funded public sector, and if the people who make the most and benefit the most from our public sector don't pay into it, then we're not gonna be able to deliver the kind of society that works for all mm -hmm. of us, including them. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna get wonky. I don't mind wearing that label and talk about a couple of numbers here because I think we should get very concrete with people. In a press statement that Bernie Sanders released when the CBO study that I just mentioned, the Congressional Budget Office study that looked at the IRS funding, Bernie released a statement and in it he says that partly because of the cuts in the IRS, and now I'm quoting from his statement, the IRS examination rate for the largest corporations, those with $20 billion or more in assets dropped by about half from 2010 to 2018. And then the second sentence in his statement, the wealthiest taxpayers with more than $1 million in income saw their audit rate cut by 63% during the same time period. And so this is the reverse model that Willie Sutton used to say about when he was asked about why did he rob banks, he would say, well, that's where the money is. Here, you've got the opposite. 
that the IRS, because of the cuts in its examination ability, its power of enforcement, is not going after the folks who have the money. Right. And it's, it's kind of crazy because the Trump administration slashed corporate taxes, right? And yet you think that you slash the rates and then you say, all right, but we're really going to enforce what we have. But in fact, they slash the rates and then they let evasion increase. And so that results in a, in a much lower level of, of revenue for the IRS. And so they actually found that if they would just increase the revenue to the IRS, the, the allotment, the government allotment to the IRS by $40 billion, they would get $61 billion more. So they'd get 100, 100 billion more. It would be a net profit for the public sector and it would be a virtuous cycle. So exactly the opposite of what we were talking about before. P people and big corporations and companies would say to themselves, wait a minute, you know, they're, they're stepping up enforcement. We ought to comply. We ought to comply with tax rates. And it would be a virtuous cycle where, you know, the audits would, would bring in the revenue that was needed, but there would also be more compliance and it would become less of a problem. So, you know, you can't help but feel that this administration really likes the idea of sort of undermining government and undermining the IRS by making them less able to enforce taxes, even as they're slashing taxes, particularly for the wealthy and corporations. Now, I want to be clear, though, since this cuts, this has happened from 2010 to 2018, I'm happy to blame the Trump administration, but this clearly happened also under the Obama administration. So there must have been cooperation, collaboration by both parties to cut the IRS. You know, I think what we have is this sort of, and actually I think we're in a good moment now, but I think what we have had over the last 20, 30 years in the United States is a basic devaluing of what the public sector delivers in so many ways. Mm. And that manifested itself in, in cutting taxes, it manifested itself in reducing enforcement, it manifested itself in, you know, Bill Clinton ending, quote unquote, ending welfare as we know it. Um, it manifested itself in a whole bunch of ways where politicians, I think, from across the political spectrum, or at least from the center right to the right, um, were, were willing to kind of undermine government and devalue the things that the government could deliver. And what I think makes me kind of hopeful right now, Jonathan, is I just think that we've had a different kind of conversation in 2019 and in 2020, where in 2019, we had you know, a really broad field of democratic candidates willing to say, hey, look, look, this is what the public sector delivers and, and this government is not working for us. And then this pandemic hit, um, the extreme racial inequities became more apparent, at least to some people who weren't paying as much attention before. Um, the loss of manufacturing jobs kind of became clearer. And the way that regular people were disproportionately hurt by both this pandemic and this economic crisis became really, really clear. And so suddenly now, you know, headlines are about the fact that essential workers can't get the personal protective equipment that they need. Headlines are about the fact that we've had an enormous plunge in health insurance coverage mm -hmm. over the course of this pandemic. And so I think the conversation is actually shifting in some really exciting and important ways that, that, are, gonna, that are gonna turn this around, where we're gonna recognize that actually we've gotta collect enough revenue from those most able to pay because we've gotta deliver so that we can have a society that functions. Right. And let's be clear that when we're talking about the hobbling of the IRS and the ability, if you just increase their enforcement to bring in like $63 billion more, that's in some way a small amount compared to what is being shoveled to corporations and the richest people under the tax cuts that were pushed through by the Trump administration, supported by basically uh, every Republican in Congress. And so that's where the, <laughs> the big money is. But of course, enforcement matters. Now, you touched on something which opened my eyes, something that I did not realize, and your colleagues at ITP noted this on your website, and that's the racial inequities that happen in terms of tax enforcement. And what really opened my eyes, I'm gonna read from this, in the fall of 2019, the IRS admitted, and this is from a document that you have on your website, that it audits low-income people at a higher rate than affluent families because, quote unquote, it's easier. In other words, lower income people, and this is certainly true 
when you go both in terms of class and race, they don't have the resources to fight the IRS. Whereas rich people and corporations, as you well know, they can create all these tax shelters, they can take uh, all sorts of measures to evade taxes, and they have legions, they have armies of lawyers, tax lawyers, experts to fight the IRS. So it sounds like what the IRS did is it basically um, hoisted the flag of white surrender when it comes to rich people and corporations and says, let's go over after the poor people and people of color. Right. Right. Yeah, it, and it's really problematic. And the CBO study found sort of slightly different numbers on that. But the point is is clear, right? Which is like, why are we spending money auditing someone who qualifies for the earned income tax credit? That's something that low income working families who actually don't make enough to meet their basic needs, despite the fact that they're working. Um, you know, why are we auditing that mom with two kids who's barely getting by? And why are we not auditing Netflix or Amazon or uh, a really wealthy individual. And um, yeah, so it, and it does, it clearly has racial implications because the top 1% and the heads of large corporations are almost entirely white. And, you know, we have a disproportionate share of people of color who are working class or, or in poverty. And so anytime that we shift any kind of enforcement or any kind of negative consequence onto lower income families and away from wealthier families and wealthier corporations, we end up with really bad racial implications. And if you add that to everything else that's going on in 2020, it's, it's a recipe for a really problematic society that really isn't like fulfilling our ideals, what we were supposed to do in America. And then one of the other pieces of important um, work that you have on your website right now is looking actually at the tax rates, the effective tax rates and what's happening. You do that every year around this time. You analyze what the effect, especially of the tax Trump, the Trump tax cuts were. And not surprisingly, again, the rich are getting away with it, right? The top 1% pay, relatively speaking, much less than other than uh, poorer people. And that has a lot to do with the burden of local and state taxes that people have as a combination. So talk for a minute or two about that. Yeah, so if people go to the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, that's ITEP.org, ITEP, that's my organization, um, you'll find our, our report, which is called Who Pays Taxes in America, it was written by two of my colleagues, uh, Steve Wamhoff and Matt Gardner, who I know are frequent guests on this mm. show. And, um, you know, they found that our tax code overall, including federal and state, is only very slightly progressive. And then if you only look at state and local, as you pointed out, then it's not progressive at all mm. because states and local governments rely disproportionately on sales taxes, which, you know, if you make $30,000 a year, you spend most of what you earn if you support a family. But if you make $200,000 a year or a million dollars a year, you don't spend most of what you earn, you sock a lot of it away. So if you rely more heavily on sales taxes, it disproportionately affects the middle class, working class, and low income families. So the state and local tax systems are regressive. If you count all taxes across the board, it's ever so slightly progressive, but nothing like what the rates would reflect because of exactly what we're talking about, that wealthy people and corporations figure out ways to get exemptions, to get out of paying taxes. In fact, corporations get out of paying taxes in part by shifting jobs offshore. So it's, it's really, really problematic. And, um, you know, there's just a lot that we could actually do about this. There are a lot of ch basic changes we can make in our tax code, some of which are just going back to the tax code that we had under Obama, some of which are going, you know, going beyond that, that would bring in more revenue and make it more fair and make sure that, that you know, that higher income people pay, pay more, which is right, because they, they get more. You, you know, what's hilarious is I remember going back to the Bill Clinton years, which now seems like really ancient history, and then to the Obama years. And when they talked about raising taxes, I thought, that's not even enough. Um, and that's the problem about the debate. It's been narrowed so um, much that you've got the Republican right wing, let's destroy government approach, which is corporations and rich people basically should not pay any taxes and we should get rid of the estate tax and oh, these poor people shouldn't be paying the estate tax and all that nonsense. And then you have Democrats come in and they say, okay, well, we'll raise the uh, rates a little bit higher, which to me never are enough. And that our tax system has a lot of movement. If you also look back at what the tax rates were back in the 1960s, 
or 1970s when we were building interstate highways, you know, you were building infrastructure, you're doing things in the country, you were uh, enhancing Medicare, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the debate has been so narrowed so that even when you have the prospect of a democratic administration coming in, it seems to me that all they are going to do is undo the worst, but not stretch as far as we could. Yeah, well, I'm going to push back on you there because I don't think you give okay, yourself. Good. Yeah, I don't think you give yourself and other progressive commentators enough credit, right? Like, I think we've really expanded the debate in the last couple of years. Um, I think the fact that some of the things that are on the table right now are incredibly exciting, and I think that uh, that you and others like you deserve a lot of credit for that, right? Like, so a wealth tax is on the table, right? We've never had this kind of a wealth tax. But uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and most Americans think it's a good idea that, you know, that when we look at the incredible wealth disparity uh, that we have in this country, that it makes sense that let's say the top 0.1%, right, maybe we ought to tax their wealth. And that would raise a lot of money. Um, I think there's an increasing recognition that in making it easier for corporations to shift j jobs overseas and actually get a tax benefit for that, that that doesn't make sense. And I think that Americans can understand that and get behind a fix to that. And then if you look at some of the proposals that are being put forth by um, Vice President Biden, you know, some of them really would, would um, enrich our communities, would, would energize our communities, would solve longstanding climate problems. You know, he recently put forth a climate plan that would employ people. He, he put it forth in such a way that it would employ people disproportionately in communities that have been excluded from good jobs. Um, let's hope that some of those jobs would be unionized so that people would have some mm -hmm. ability to, to bargain for fair wages in those positions. And that's gonna cost money. And I think that there's a recognition now that if we are gonna have the kind of America that we need that can confront the kinds of problems that are coming up, which is climate change and the kinds of problems that are here now, which is this pandemic, we're gonna to need to spend some money and really reinforce our systems. And as you said, you know, that's something we had no trouble doing in the middle of the 20th century. We said, look, we're, we've got a society that's not all that well educated, that not everybody has a high school degree or a college degree. Let's put some money into that. And we did. And, you know, we became the most educated country on the planet at the time. Um, at the time, as you said, we didn't have the kind of physical infrastructure, railroads and, and highways. We spent some money on that and we got it. And that was what enabled a lot of... Um, current corporations that, that have thrived to do so. And, so I think we've got to do that going forward. And by the way, the interstate highway that we are so familiar with, the I-10, I-80, it's called, generally speaking, the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System because it was put in place and built by then the president, Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower. So, okay, you're optimistic. That's really good. I can't wait to talk to you in, say, March or April of 2021, assuming there's a Biden administration, and I'm going to wager with you that we, progressives, are going to be fighting them to follow through with what they promised today. Well, absolutely. And I, you know, actually, you raise a really good point because that's how everything good has gotten done in this country, right? It's not like somebody benevolent comes in and just decides to wave a magic wand. Policy is highly consistent contested in this country. You're always going to have corporations pushing to lower their tax rates. You're always going to have some wealthy billionaires pushing to lower their tax rates, even as some are saying, hey, tax us more. Um, and you're always going to have people who benefit from the racism and classism and uh, lack of environmental enforcement that, that enriches them. But the only way that we've ever gotten good policy from FDR to Johnson to Obama um, and everyone in between is when when um, fair-minded progressives stand up and say, you know what, we got to invest in our communities. You know what, this racial inequity is not permissible. You know what, it's not reasonable that working class people no longer get their share of economic growth. Hmm. We got to push them to do the right thing. I love your energy and your brains and your knowledge and your passion. And uh, I'm sure you're going to be on the program many, many times, not just uh, in 2021, but before. Thanks for being on the show, Amy. Great talking to you. Take care. That'll do it for this week's show. I want to thank my guests, Rahima Mahmoud, Brian Finnegan, and Amy Hanauer. 
Our editor, as usual, is the amazing David Hebden. Our major sponsor is the American Postal Workers Union. Now, you can support us and become one of our sponsors at whatever level you can afford. You could do that, as I mentioned earlier in the show, in two ways. You can go over to workinglife.org. You can click on the podcast tab and then follow that link over to Patreon, and you can become a monthly sponsor or a one-time sponsor, or if you're more comfortable, do it through Act Blue. We've partnered with Act Blue. You can go over to Act Blue and make a monthly donation, a regular monthly donation, or a one-time donation. And you can do that with the ease that you're used to in using Act Blue. Most importantly, please spread the word of the show. Ask your friends, your people on your email list, your social media friends to sign up and subscribe to our show. And that'll help broaden our message and get more listeners who can get this information that I think you're not going to be finding in most places out there, certainly not in the traditional media, but even out there on the internet. Thanks for being here. Look forward to having you back next week. Bye.